Okay, I would like us to please turn again to John's Gospel, chapter 19, and I'd like to begin reading in verse 16, and I'm going to read down to verse 37, and uh, we are going to at least attempt to contemplate together Calvary today. And so let's just read this uh, together. It says in verse 16, Then delivered he him, therefore unto them, to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier, a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was in high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. But these things were done, that the scriptures should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Oh, sorry, we'll, we'll stop there, verse 37. So again, God will bless that reading of this wonderful portion of scripture uh, to our hearts. And in a very real sense, uh, Calvary is the place where two eternities meet. Eternity past has been moving towards this moment, uh, this lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And all of the progressive revelation of scripture, the, the types, the prophecies are all leading to this point, what the Lord Jesus calls his hour. An eternity future for men will depend entirely on how people respond to this event. What will they do with Calvary? What will they do with this man uh, hanging on that center cross? 
Uh, what will they do with Jesus? That will determine their eternal destiny. And so in a very real sense, this, this is the crux of the matter. Uh, it really is. It's interesting how the word crux uh, is a word that literally means cross. <laughs> and when we talk about something being the crux of the matter, it's derived from this idea. This is the crux of the matter. What will you do with the one who hung on that tree, the Lord Jesus Christ? This event has inspired poets, it has inspired artists, it has inspired hymn writers, uh, and some of them, they, they've sought somehow to plumb the depths of what was taking place at this place we call Calvary. And uh, many of them are wonderful, but they all seem to fall short. I think it's going to take the whole of eternity future to unveil the magnitude of what was taking place at this place called Calvary. But I did wake up this morning with that song on my mind, Calvary or Dark Calvary, where Jesus shed his precious blood for me. And what a, what a wonderful thing it is to be reminded of this place called Calvary. And so as we begin, we notice in, in verse 16, it says, then delivered he him, therefore, unto them. And of course, uh, <clears throat> the delivering him is the Lord Jesus, and the them is to the execution squad. And this execution squad usually uh, comprised four legionnaires, and usually it was overseen by a centurion. So that was the typical execution squad. And so he's now handed over to this execution squad for them to do their work. It says, <clears throat> then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And we, we want to think about some of the things that are omitted by John just for a moment. For instance, uh, it tells us that they took him from prison and from judgment. And so perhaps uh, part of uh, they took him first to incarceration because we know that he was, uh, this is early in the morning and his crucifixion was from noon until three in the afternoon. So perhaps uh, there was some time of incarceration as things were prepared for the actual execution. And, and then uh, as he, eventually does come from prison, uh, he is taken on what is often called today the Via Della Rosa, although very likely uh, that's not exactly the route he took because uh, it's there have been so many destructions of Jerusalem, there's so much rubble that probably none of the sites that we are so familiar with are the original places. But nevertheless, uh, if we were to even just take the Via Della Rosa, it's a, it's a mile journey uh, and again, we think of uh, the Lord Jesus uh, walking a mile after being scourged and then bearing the cross. And so along that journey, there are certain things that John doesn't tell us about. Uh, one of the things, and we're not going to spend a lot of time, I'm just going to give you the references uh, because I want to stick to John's account of this. But uh, one of the things that is omitted is that uh, in Jerusalem, a place that really had very little sympathy for the Lord Jesus. Uh, he was certainly well received in other places, uh, in Galilee. Uh, but in, in, in this uh, kind of Jerusalem was the center, really, of, of both the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and their, their religious system and their influence was pretty powerful. And so uh, very little sympathy, but along the route, we read that the daughters of Jerusalem wept for him. And so that's interesting. That's found, for instance, if you want to take your time and look at it, it's Luke 23, verse 28. Uh, and so there's at least some measure of sympathy, not from the men, but from the daughters of Jerusalem. And of course, the Lord says, don't weep for me, weep for yourself. We know the story quite well. But nevertheless, there was at least some sympathy. Another thing that John admits to tell us is that, uh, that along the way, Although John tells us, and he alone tells us, that Jesus carried his cross, but it would seem that along the way, uh, 
um, perhaps out of sheer exhaustion or as a result of the scourging, uh, he is either going so too slow, uh, perhaps stumbles, but a man uh, called Simon of Cyrene is compelled to carry his cross. And again, we find that in Matthew's account in Matthew 27, verse 32. And it's interesting, we often talk about taking up the cross. Uh, Simon of Cyrene was compelled. He had no option to do it. It wasn't a voluntary thing. But when the Lord Jesus talks about, uh, if anybody will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. It's not some involuntary thing. It's a voluntary choice to take the cross. And of course, uh, often being said, I think Leonard Ravenhill put it well. He said, when you saw a man going out of a city carrying his cross, you knew he wasn't coming back. <laughs> it, was, it was death. And in a very real sense, uh, if we don't get anything else from this, and I, I know we will because this is such a profitable passage, but we need to remind ourselves that the Lord carried his cross but he asks us also to take up a cross. And, and the idea is death to self, death to the self-life. Uh, this is an instrument of execution. This is not some piece of jewelry that you hang around your neck. This is a death to the old life, death to self. And this is a, a dying to every goal and ambition I ever had that I might live wholly for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, surely as we consider this today, we're going to see he is worthy of such a response from all of our hearts. And so we might ask ourselves, are we, are we daily willing to take up our cross? But anyway, John does tell us in verse 17, in he bearing his cross. And again, the the normal procedure uh, was that they would carry the cross piece. Uh, cross is comprised of two. There's an upright, there's a cross piece. And the, the condemned criminal would be expected to carry the cross piece. Uh, and he would usually uh, be a public kind of demonstration as a warning to others. This is what happens to those that dare to rebel against Rome. And usually, as well as carrying the cross piece, there would be a placard around their neck. And this placard would have their name and the crimes for which they were accused. Again, just as a warning to others. And eventually, as they were nailed to the cross, uh, to the, the final piece of the upright, they would nail that placard, which uh, has the accusation for which they have been uh, crucified. And we're going to see more of that as we proceed in this. But I want you just to get the scene of the Lord Jesus bearing his cross. It says he went forth to a place called into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. There's several things that we want to point out here. First of all, I do believe it's a fulfillment of a beautiful type uh, that we find back in the book of Genesis and, and chapter 22, where I'm sure we're very familiar with it, but it's the, the story of, of Isaac, uh, a son uh, who, the only son of his father who he loved, uh, who was to be offered as a sacrifice. And in Genesis 22, verse 6, it says, Abraham took the wood of, of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And so just as Isaac carried the wood that would be instrumental uh, in his execution, the Lord Jesus, fulfilling type, the, this only son, loved of the father, carried his cross. He, he bore his cross. And so he went forth, and he went to this place. Now, again, the emphasis of John is, that the Lord Jesus is taking it up in order to finish his work. It's not mentioned in the other Gospels, but John wants to bring out that here's the son doing the father's will and, and eager to finish that work. So he takes up his cross and he goes to this place called the place of the skull. And so the idea is the Lord Jesus is intent on completing this work that has been given 
to him by the father. And then it takes it to a, he takes it to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Now, now the, there's several thoughts here. First of all, that um, perhaps it was named that because it was um, the, the place looked like a skull. And that's where Gordon's Calvary comes in. If any of you have ever been to Jerusalem and have you been to Gordon's Calvary, uh, you will see an old picture of Gordon's Calvary before the Muslims built a cemetery on the top of it and before some of it had collapsed. And it just looks identical to a skull. <laughs> it really, it's kind of quite remarkable. And so uh, many believe that that, that is the site, uh, Gordon's Calvary, uh, rather than the traditional site uh, where uh, I actually didn't even go into the traditional site because I was so tired of man-made religion, the thought of watching people kiss this piece of ground. I just couldn't bring myself to even go in. I stood outside. Uh, but I, but Gordon's Calvary, I could see. I could see that that was uh, a possible site. But the main point is this. It's ironic that it was a place of a skull because here human intelligence is seen in all its bankruptcy. What did they do with the creator, <laughs> with the eternal son of God? What did human intelligence, how did it respond to the, the savior of the world? Well, it nailed him to a cross. And, and it just shows us we cannot depend on human intelligence. Uh, it's, it's bankrupt. It, it's the place of a skull, the place of the blundering blindness of human intelligence the place uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians 2 8, if the princes of this world had known, they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But their own intelligence couldn't find him out. <laughs> they couldn't find out the truth. And, and so, again, we just see the folly. Uh, and sometimes we elevate human intelligence. And, uh, and yet we see here it's absolute utter bankruptcy, the place of the skull which is also called in Hebrew, uh, Golgotha. <clears throat> and uh, again, so this very, very significant place, uh, the site where the Lord Jesus would be crucified. And it says where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. Now, all the gospel writers tell us about the two thieves, but John is the only one who uses the phrase Jesus in the midst. And it is a, a kind of a significant thing. Uh, the others assume that. It talks about one on either side, but, but John uses the exact term Jesus in the midst. And of course, it, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? That God always wants his son, but whether it's in suffering or in glory, he always wants his son to be in the central place in the midst. <laughs> and of course, we often talk about gathering to the name of the Lord Jesus, and we talk about Jesus being in our midst. And, and the idea is this, that he is the center of everything. Uh, this place called Calvary, where Jesus is in the midst, it's the center of all God's purposes are found here. Uh, this is the most important place. And Jesus must always have the central place. He must always be in the midst. And in, in his suffering, in his glory, God always wants him there. He has no other place for him. He wants him in the center. And if he's not, if he's to one side in our lives, it's a recipe for disaster. It's only when we keep Christ the center that it's, uh, that's the place of progress. That's the place of blessing is to have him in the central place. And the enemy would always love us to, to put him to one side. You can have all the religion you want, but don't have him in the center of it all. Uh, have him uh, kind of sideline some way. And we need to make sure that the Lord Jesus is preeminent. He was preeminent in his scourging and in his suffering, and he will be in the center stage in glory as well. Jesus in the midst. And of course, when we gather, we gather around the person of the Lord Jesus, who we believe is in the midst. 
And so we've considered the sentence in verses 13 through 16. We've considered the site, this place called the place of the skull, Golgotha, the place we call Calvary. And now we want to think of the superscription from verse 19 through 22. And so notice it says, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, it's very interesting that John, again, is the only one that says it was a title. The other writers either say it was an inscription or they'll say it was an accusation. But John uses the phrase title. And of course, that is a very different thing, isn't it? This is his title. He really has the title to kingship. And the Jews can't change it. And the Romans wouldn't change it. And it is his title. It is a title of him. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. The writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Of course, they didn't like that one bit. And not only the fact that it was written, uh, that he was the king of the Jews, that it was written in three languages, which was typical. Uh, <clears throat> it says uh, the title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. Now, again, I want you to see that it's near to the city. It's not in the city because he was crucified, as we're going to see later, outside the camp. The, in, in the center of the city, he wasn't welcome there. He was outside the camp. But nevertheless, uh, it says uh, it, it was nigh to the city. And so many Jews read this title as they walked past. And it was written in three distinct languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And these three languages are very significant. For instance, Hebrew, uh, it's, the, it's the language of the Jewish religion. Okay. In a sense, so it's the, it, in a sense, what we see at the cross is here's what the religious world did to the Son of God. And then as we, we think of Latin, uh, that was the language of the Roman Empire, that was the language of the political world. And what did politics do to the Son of God? Well, it crucified him. And then Greek. Well, Greek is the language of the cultural world, uh, the, the language of the, 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 the poets, the language of the philosophers. It's, it's, the, it's the language of the, the, the world of culture. And ironically, they all come together it, this one place called Calvary. And what we can see is this, that the world is at enmity with God. <laughs> All together, the religious world, the political world, the cultural world, we're all in agreement on this one thing. <laughs> we will not have this man to reign over us. And they were involved in the crucifixion of Christ. And we need to remind ourselves, scripture reminds us often, friendship of the world, whether it's the political world or the religious world or the cultural world, friendship with the world is enmity with God. We're taking sides with those that crucified the Savior. And that's why we come out and we're separate. We gather to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Is this vile world a friend to grace to lead me on to God? And the answer is no, it isn't. It's no friend to grace. It was unified in its condemnation of the Son of God. And so it says in verse 18, where they crucified him, Two are with him, one on either side, Jesus in the midst. Pilate wrote a title, verse 20, this title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified, nigh to the city, was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. So they're obviously very upset with this. Uh, they, they wouldn't be too perturbed 
if it said that he claimed to be the king of the Jews, but the fact that Pilate said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, to this they took exception and they were very upset with him and they asked him and interceded with him to change it. And Pilate finally got a psychological victory against these uh, this, uh, these men, this, the Jewish hierarchy who had twisted his arm and, and somehow bullied him into doing something he didn't want to do. And now he was his chance to get his own back. And so Pilate answered, much to their chagrin and their disappointment, what I have written, I have written. And so he finally exacts psychological revenge on the Jewish hierarchy and refuses to change it. And so uh, the Jews couldn't change it, and the Roman authority refused to change it, and the title stands. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And there's a coming day when he will be acknowledged by the Jews as their king. <laughs> Behold, your king cometh unto thee. <laughs> he's coming, and he's coming, and they will acknowledge the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ in a coming day. And so <clears throat> we move on now to consider not only have we seen the superscription, we're going to look at the soldiers and particularly the division of the garments. And again, this is quite uh, remarkable. It says, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And so, first of all, it says, when they had crucified Jesus, the idea is that they had, uh, they had nailed him to the cross, and they had hoisted the cross up, they had dropped it into the hole previously dig, dug uh, and uh, the jolt and all the rest of it. So the actual act of crucifixion, they had now uh, fulfilled that responsibility. And once they did that, they <coughs> then uh, took uh, his garments. And of course, there was a difficulty uh, because um, there were four soldiers. A centurion wouldn't be involved in this. Uh, because it would be certainly beneath his dignity. But for the common soldiers, for the legionnaires, part of the understanding was that they got the clothing of the person who was crucified. And of course, clothing was very different in those days because it was all handmade and it was very expensive. It's not like the cheap rags you can buy today, although it's they're not so cheap if you get designer stuff, but the regular stuff is fairly inexpensive. But in those days, uh, this is handmade, it's expensive stuff. And so this, this was kind of part of their, uh, one of the perks of the job. And so they would uh, do this. And of course, it reminds us in a sense that here's this king of the Jews, and yet for our sakes, he became poor, <laughs> dying with absolutely nothing, not even the clothing on his back. <laughs> they took that from him, that we might be made rich. And I want you just to try and imagine the scene. Imagine you're uh, on your deathbed and the relatives around the bed, instead of comforting you, they're going through the drawers, seeing what they can get. <laughs> uh, it certainly wouldn't be a comforting experience, would it? Uh, they're rooting through your clothes. Oh, I'm going to have that. Oh, this, is, this looks great. I can't wait to get this. And this is exactly the scene. Uh, nothing of comfort here at all, uh, even uh, <clears throat> dividing the clothes of his wardrobe. And of course, these soldiers had no conception of what they were doing. Uh, this was their normal procedure. And yet the beauty of it all is if we look back to Psalm 22, we see that these ignorant Roman soldiers are actually involved in fulfilling a scripture written a thousand years before, a millennium before, Psalm 22 and verse 18 says, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Such incredible accuracy, precision, fulfillment of scripture. And yet by people who I'm certain these Roman soldiers 
had not spent any time meditating on Psalm 22. <laughs> they had no idea of that they were, they were God's instruments, in a sense, of fulfilling his holy word by just doing what soldiers in those days normally did. They took spoil. And so we mentioned, actually, the Lord, there's four soldiers, but there were five pieces of clothing. One of them would have got his footwear. Another would have got his headgear. Another would have got his outer robe. And another would have got the girdle that he would have wrapped around his waist. And that left one thing, this seamless robe, uh, which was worn as the, the, the kind of undergarment. And then you've got all these other pieces that surrounded it. And so it tells us, <clears throat> Verse 24, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it because it was a seamless garment. Let us not rend it because it wouldn't be any valuable to anybody if it was cut up. It says, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith they parted my raiment among them and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. So even down to casting lots for this seamless uh, garment, uh, seamless robe. And of course, this seamless robe is interesting because uh, perhaps it emphasizes to us the priestly character of the Lord Jesus. We've already witnessed him as king when Pilate presented him to them and remember, he's wearing the, the, the scarlet robe and the crown of thorns. And Pilate says, behold, you're king. We've also seen him as prophet. If you look back at John 18, 32, it says that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Because he had said the son of man must be lifted up. And the normal uh, method of, of execution for blasphemy was stoning. And so his prophetic aspect is being emphasized. And some suggest, and I think they're quite right, that this seamless robe is emphasizing the priestly aspect of the Lord Jesus as well. The one who is being crucified is God's prophet, priest, and king, our beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've seen the soldiers but now uh, we saw four soldiers gambling for his clothing. And now we're going to see the sympathizers. And we're going to see four sympathizers. There's, there's, there is some sympathy. Just as the daughters of Jerusalem brought some sympathy as he made his way to the cross, now he's on the cross. Once again, women are there to give some sympathy, some, some, in a sense, some humanity to this inhuman behavior. And so it's just delightful to, to witness this. And so it says in verse 25, excuse me. now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. So there's Mary, his mother, Salome, uh, the sister of Mary, because it says, and his mother's sister. And so that's Salome, sister of Mary, uh, which would be his aunt. And then Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and then Mary Magdalene, or Mary from Magdala. And uh, so, again, there's a softening now. This Up to now, it's just been a hard scene. But now there are some women at the cross. Again, we, we often say they were, they were last at the cross and first at the empty tomb. And again, we see this lovely sympathetic aspect of the, the women being there at the cross. And so uh, just wonderful to see that there are, there's some support there. There's some sympathy uh, being shown uh, by these women, women that supported the Lord Jesus of their substance in terms of his ministry. Uh, and so here they are to the bitter end, standing there with him. It's interesting, Mary of Bethany wasn't there because Mary already knew 
about his burial and his resurrection. <laughs> she remember she was ahead of the game and she had anointed him. Uh, she didn't need to be there. She knew, but but there, again, there are these uh, women there at the cross. And verse twenty six says, "When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son." So <laughs> we, we find here, as well as these women. The, the man who laid on his bosom stood at his cross and uh, the care of the Lord's mother uh, was now given to John as a new commission. And I imagine this would have been quite the blessing for him in a sense, especially as he uh, was right in his gospel. You can imagine uh, him you know, reading the first chapter to Mary and saying to her, well, what do you think about this? I mean, he, she's now living in his home, you see. She's, she's put into his care. And so uh, he, again, we see, first of all, the selflessness of the Lord Jesus while he's in his agony on Calvary's cross, he's constantly thinking of others. The other gospel writers talk about him thinking about the dying thief and even those that crucified him. Father, forgive them. And here he is concerned uh, with his mother and her well-being and her care. And so a couple of interesting things that we need to consider here. Firstly, we might ask the question, why, why was he not entrusting Mary to his brothers and sisters? Because, uh, or we would say half brothers and sisters, uh, look back, please, just at, for instance, at Mark's gospel, chapter six. Mark chapter six and verse three. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and of Joseph and of Judah and of Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And so there are obviously siblings that were could have easily have taken on the responsibility of caring for Mary. But we're told in John 7, and we've already seen this, John 7, verse 5, John 7 and verse 5, it says, for neither did his brethren believe in him. And so even though he had people who were relatives, uh, at least uh, uh, related, uh, same mother, different father, uh, he, he didn't commit them to him, to them because they were not believers, but he committed the care to John. And again, there's a kind of a fulfillment of scripture here too. If we go back to the Psalms, and again, a thousand years before, then we might put a marker in this because we're going to be back to this Psalm 69 more than once in the time that remains. And so uh, in Psalm 69 and verse 8, he says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. A stranger to my brethren, an alien to my mother's children. And so what we, we find is, in, and this is an important point, really, um, that our spiritual family takes precedence over to our earthly family. Now, of course, it's wonderful if our earthly family are also our spiritual family. <laughs> there's, there's no greater joy, right, than our children walking in truth. Uh, but but there, there is... A, a difference between our spiritual family and our physical family. And belief is the, ter- the difference. It, it's a whole worldview, a whole different way of looking at life. And so we, we should be uh, recognize the importance uh, very much so of our spiritual family. They're our real family. And our earthly family may forsake us. And there are many of the Lord's people who have experienced rejection by their earthly family, but have received a warm welcome in their spiritual family. And again, for those of us that are part of 
um, families where you're all believers, be sensitive to those who, for the cause of Christ, have been rejected by their loved ones and be there willing, like John was willing, to take them in and to show love and care for them, especially at times like the holidays and things like that. Be sensitive to this. Uh, don't be uh, insular and self-centered. Think about the family of God and especially in their, in their time of need. And so we certainly see uh, that the Lord's care uh, for the well-being of his mother. And, and notice it, we, we've said before that uh, he just uses this term woman. Now, it's kind of uh, somewhat ironic that he does because uh, Mary is mentioned and the, the Lord used this term woman to her on two occasions. Uh, one is at a wedding. And now, in a sense, at a funeral or at the, the, the death of the Lord Jesus. And in both instances, he says woman. And in the first instance, he said, woman, my hour is not yet come. You remember, she wants him to intervene and turn the water into wine. And he says, my hour has not yet come. And now, once again, he uses the word woman. And I'm sure that it would, uh, there would be an echo in her mind. And she would remember the statement, woman, my hour has not yet come. But now his hour had come. <laughs> and the very, just even the very mention of woman would take her back to that very statement. And of course, <clears throat> notice what it tells us here. It says <clears throat> that, verse 27, then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother, and from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. And we do believe that at that moment, uh, John took her from the cross and uh, from the site of the cross and took her to his home, which we said was in Jerusalem. Remember, he had he's from Galilee, but he also had a home in Jerusalem as well. And he, he took uh, Mary to that home and there she would remain. And uh, <clears throat> she was spared the sight, really, of the rest of the work of Christ on Calvary. And there's a, there's a good, there's several good reasons for this. Uh, certainly, uh, it had been prophesied by Simeon, a sword will pierce your own soul also. And you can imagine uh, for this woman to, to witness the reproach. There was reproach at his birth because of all the, the gossip that went around, you know, because uh, because she and Joseph were betrothed but not married. And so there was a reproach at, at his birth and now at his death. Here's a mother and the son is accused of being a criminal and an enemy of the, the empire and all the rest of it. And so she's, she's taken from that. And so in a sense, the, the words of Simeon uh, certainly seen here in the, in the reproach and the scandal at the cross. But also she's taken from the scene because, again, God knew that down through the centuries, um, this false teaching called Roman Catholicism would come into play. And one of the, the evil false doctrines of Romanism is that Mary was co-redeemer, the co-redemptrix. And uh, I've, if, it's, if you go to Dublin, Ireland, and I'm sure in many other places, but this one sticks out because I've driven past it many times, uh, there's St. Peter's Church in Dublin, and they have a crucifix outside the church, like many Catholic churches do. And on one side, Jesus is hanging, and on the other side, Mary is hanging. And again, that is an affirmation of their belief that she was co-redeemer. And she wasn't there in those three hours of darkness when Jesus became the sin bearer. She's whisked away from the scene. She's shut up in the house of John, and she's not there when this takes place because Christ bore our sins in his own body on that tree, and he did it alone, and nobody shared in that work. He is the only redeemer. And so we notice in verse 28, we, we've seen this, the sympathizers, the women at the cross. Now we want to see the sponge. And it says, and after this, Jesus, knowing 
that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And I remember I said, keep a marker in Psalm 69, because Psalm 69 is being fulfilled here. And so in verse 3, it says, I am weary of my crying, my throat is dried, mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. And then as well, please, in verse 21, it says, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Now, it's kind of interesting to observe here that uh, when, when the Lord Jesus first arrived at the site that we call the place of the skull, Golgotha, Calvary, normally what would have been done was they would offer the Lord Jesus a drink which would be sour wine mixed with either gall or myrrh. And he refused that because it was basically uh, a, a way of uh, nulling the pain. It was, it was you know, like an, uh, an, 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 a, a, a way of deadening the pain. It would be like you give people morphine uh, to, to dull the pain. And so uh, the Lord Jesus refused that at the beginning because he w- was able to bear the cross in full consciousness and full intelligence. No dulling of the pain. He, he was to endure that cross, and he was very conscious of that. But here, uh, at the, towards the, uh, he's now hanging on the cross, and in his thirst, they offered him vinegar to drink. No, no gall added, no myrrh added, just pure vinegar that would often be kept at the bottom of the cross, lifted up uh, on a hyssop, and it says, and, and he put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And so, in a sense, both are are fulfilled here. They gave also gall for my meat, and in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And so the Lord Jesus, it says, uh, just first of all, look at verse, uh, in verse 28, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. Again, because he hadn't taken the drug uh, to null his senses in, in, in full intelligence and, of course, divine omniscience. He knew that all things were now accomplished. And in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, so he's even conscious of the word of God, it's on his mind, he cries out, I thirst. So it says, they were set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled the sponge with vinegar, put it upon hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So several things that come to our mind now as we we look at this marvelous scripture. First of all, um, it is finished. Knowing that all things were accomplished, he says, it is finished. Finished the work that his father had given him to do. Accomplished redemption. Uh, This has been accomplished. The ransom price paid. The father glorified. This is not a cry of despair. It's a cry of victory. It is finished. And and again, it's, it's a cry. Uh, it says, he said, it is finished. Uh, and then again, there's, there's no sense of exhaustion here. There's a triumphant cry, paid in full, expiation completed, a victory cry, 109 prophecies are fulfilled up to this moment. It's all done. It's finished. All the eternal anticipation in eternity past has now been accomplished. It is finished. And many say, and uh, uh, who am I to question them, that this phrase, uh, and I'm probably saying it wrong, tetelestai, was written uh, on tax documents when full payment was made, and it was stamped on it, and it simply means paid in full. It's complete. It's paid for. Notice, too, just uh, this idea of it's finished. Apparently, the, the... the Greek verb from which the word tetelestai comes from is used three times in these verses. 
uh, twice in verse 28, where it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, so you've got accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So accomplished, fulfilled, and then verse 30, finished. And so three times, accomplished, fulfilled, finished. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? It's all accomplished. It's all fulfilled. It's all finished. Nothing can be added to that work. It's complete. It's accomplished. It's finished. It's fulfilled. Oh, what a wonderful work the Lord Jesus did. And notice it says, and he bowed his head. Finally, tells us that the Lord had no place to lay his, to rest his head, to lay his head. But finally, he rests it down upon his chest and he, he bows his head. And again, showing he is in control to the very end, it says, he gave up the ghost. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. John chapter 10, verse 18. He gave up the ghost. He dismissed his spirit. He died of his own volition for our sin. And it's, it's just, again, a wonderful thing to remind ourselves as we uh, kind of bring our thoughts to close uh, this session that <clears throat> so much is being fulfilled at this particular time and again it, it it's it's incredible to see all of the anticipation all the psalms and prophets uh, that had been looking forward to this occasion prophetically and now this hour has come and the lord is in control to the very last breath he gave up his go- the ghost. You know, it's interesting that sometimes people would survive up to 36 hours on the cross. But the Lord Jesus, he laid down his life. No one took it from him. He's in control to the very end. And aren't we glad, by the way, that it's finished? Aren't we thankful there's nothing to add? Nothing we can add to that work? Now, now, redeemed by precious blood, now we ourselves have a choice to make. And that is this, and it's the cross of discipleship. Am I willing now as a voluntary act to take up my cross on a daily basis, death to my ambitions, my goals, my plans, and simply want his? I want to take up this cross and follow him because If anyone is worthy of following, it's this one who went to this place called Calvary and died in our place and in our stead. He bore our sin in his own body on the tree, and it is finished. Nothing to add. Or Calvary, dark Calvary, where Jesus shed his blood for me. What a place. What a person. What a work. What's our response to Calvary? May God encourage us to be those that voluntarily take up our cross on a daily basis to follow him.